Welcome, everyone. You have a really good turnout. Thank you all for coming. Um, I hope everybody was able to um, sign in and get some food. Um, my name is Penelope Van Pyle. I won't say I'm the projector. <laughs> I'm the Associate Director of the Honda Center for Human Rights and International Justice, which is hosting this uh, talk today. I'm really honored to be able to introduce our speaker today, um, Christoph Sapperling, who's a really formidable scholar and um, a longtime friend and collaborator of the center and of my boss, our faculty director, David Cohen. Uh, Dr. Safferling holds the chair in, international, no, in criminal law, criminal procedure, and international law at the University of Ireland in Nuremberg. And he is also one of the vice presidents of the Advisory Council on the International Nuremberg Principles Academy. Today, he's going to share with us findings from some really extensive research um, that he undertook into the post-war establishment of the German Federal Ministry of Justice. Um, and the German experience with lustration practices um, post, post war and in the transition to the modern German state. Um, we'll have an opportunity for some question and answer at the end, um, but he'll start by giving his presentation with his findings. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Tafferly. Thank you so much, Penelope, for the warm welcome, and thank you all for showing up. And Really impressed by by this crowd. By I by I get I, I I guess whenever you have the word Nazi in the title, you know, it's <laughs> easy to, to show up. What I'm going to do to do is now in for the next 50 minutes to uh, tell you the story of the Rosenberg. And this is very much this building which you see here. It's an interesting looking monstrous villa on the edge of Bonn, which of course was the German capital. Um, until reunification in 1990. And the Federal Ministry of Justice indeed was situated in this place. I mean, you must imagine in the late 40s, early 50s, Germany and indeed Bonn being destroyed by the war. So you were, you know, suffering uh, for uh, facilities and there was this little place um, still available and this is um, how um, where the ministry then um, found found a place to be. It was actually built uh, in the 19th century by a professor of paleontology. I don't know, but at that time, obviously, professors were better paid. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to tell you about this, uh, this uh, research, which I had uh, the honor and pleasure to undertake. It was, um, um, it was uh, demanded by the Federal Ministry of Justice we started in 2012. We, that means um, a colleague of mine, an historian, and me being a lawyer. You see him on the right uh, hand side here. That's Manfred Goethemacher from the University of, of Potsdam. And it was the then 2012 Minister of Justice, Sabine Leuthauser-Schnarrenberger, down here, who initiated the study and asked us to look at all the personal files of all the staff, the personnel, that worked at the ministry starting from 1949 up until 1973. Uh, the later Minister of Justice, Heiko Maas, who of course now is our foreign minister, you might have uh, come across this face in international news. Um, he then was the Minister of Justice and uh, he, he then uh, presented our final report, which we handed down in 2016. So four or five years even of intensive, uh, intensive research, which I'm going to present. We had several conferences in between. It was very, um, it was very important for us and also to the, to the ministry to do this in a public discourse. We call this um, public history, that we don't sit in our rooms and you know, draft some sort of reporting, but we continue this from the very beginning on to be a public process, a public, a public uh, enterprise. So we had several conferences. Uh, you see one here in the European Academy of, uh, of Berlin and another one from the House of the Wannsee Conference, actually, which is now a documentation center. Whenever you happen to be in Berlin, you know, don't, uh, don't miss that. Go down to the Wannsee and look at this uh, very impressive how so in this room, the Wannsee Protocol was actually, the Wannsee Conference actually took, uh, took uh, place where the final solution of the, to the Jewish question was sort of put down in, in paper. 
So we had these conferences discussing with other experts because, as you might know, it is a goal of the German government to actually look into this area, this, 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 this time of, of, of the uh, establishing of the Republic of Germany, um, in particular with regard to the Nazi past. It is now in our coalition treaty that several ministries, ideally all of them, have similar studies. And uh, the first one that, that was actually underway was uh, from the Foreign Office. Our former Green Foreign Minister, Joschka Fischer, <coughs> he initiated a study in 2005, and the report was published in 2010. It was very distressing for the German public at that time, uh, the results that the colleagues came about. And so, you know, other ministries followed, and we were, so to speak, the second, and others are on their way. So we had. Discuss, discuss, discussions going on with colleagues on our finding and their findings and compared <coughs> the different studies. So what I'm going to do now in the next uh, 45 minutes, I'm first going to present to you the two heads of uh, the department which I'm talking about, the Ministry of Justice, so the minister and his deputy. And then I'm going to talk a little about the general uh, dealing with the past policy that was approached by Germany um, after its, its foundation. And thirdly, then, I'm going to focus on the um, actual personnel, on the staff, and give a broader overview, and then going to talk a little about individual biographies and what they actually dealt with before and after the war. So when we start looking at um, these two main figures uh, who were running the ministry and obviously deciding uh, who would be employed to work at the ministry, we have these two persons here. On the left-hand side, you see the first minister of justice, Thomas Dieler. On the right-hand side, the picture is Walter Strauss, his deputy. Um, Thomas Dieler, interestingly enough, he comes from the town of Bamberg, and he was a practicing lawyer in his hometown. And he actually was married to a German Jewish wife. And I don't know whether you are aware of this, but when you are, as a Jew, aware at that time, as a Jewish person married to a Aryan non-Jewish person, you were in a so-called privileged marriage. For me as a lawyer, I have to admit it's always very difficult and strange to talk about legal things in such a way. I mean, how perverse is this, you know, to identify a, a, a marriage as privileged because one of them is not of a certain race or religion or whatever. But that, those, that's, that's where the law, this was the outcome of the Nuremberg Race Law of 1935. So he wasn't in, a, in an awkward position, but his wife would have been. But due to him also uh, sticking to this, uh, to this marriages, marriage, both of them uh, survived with difficulties. And keep in mind, they had a daughter. She was uh, half Jew, so she also had difficulties in that time. But they came, they came, they came around and survived um, at the war in Bamberg, him being a practicing lawyer with very close connections to the Jewish community all through the war, and he helped wherever he could um, uh, his, his, Jewish, um, his Jewish friends. Uh, Walter Strauss, now this is very, very uh, coincidental maybe, but he, that was the other way around. Walter Strauss himself comes from a Jewish background. His parents were Jew Jewish. He himself converted to Protestantism, but of course you know what this, uh, what this means. Um, so he was considered still to be, uh, to be a Jew, um, according to the race law. And again, he was in a privileged marriage because he was married to a German non-Jewish wife. And he, had, uh, he, he started actually out working for the Reichsministry of the Economy until 1933, when all of the Jews were driven out of office, he had to leave. But he knew sort of the ministry from the inside, uh, which might be important for his behavior after the war. So he knew how civil service worked in Germany. And obviously, he appreciated the bureaucratic structure in Germany very much. Um, he survived the war with difficulties, but uh, due to his privileged marriages with friends also in the Berlin, uh, region and after the war, 
Um, he then became also involved in politics. He was one of the founding members of the CDU, our conservative party, the Christian Democratic <laughs> Union in, in, in Berlin. He then worked uh, for, the, uh, for the occupation administration in Frankfurt. He was uh, head, of, uh, head of the, um, the, the legal office um, of the bisonal bi administration in, in Frankfurt. So those were the two persons. Um, who obviously are not sort of um, not sort of su suspect of being Nazis. Quite the opposite. I mean, they were in some way or other um, where they persecuted and had difficulties uh, during these twelve years from 1933 to 1945. <laughs> but now they had to decide on whom actually to take on to you know fulfill this new democratic constitution, this liberal approach with life. And whom now did they choose? Well, what they found were sort of two sets of lawyers, so to speak. One you could describe as these little Fritz Bauers. I don't know how famous Fritz Bauer is in, in the United States. He's a very famous person in Germany indeed. He was a, a Jewish a judge in 1933. Also, like all the other Jews, he was driven out of office. Um, he then um, fled to um, the Scandinavian countries, Denmark and, and Norway, where he uh, lived through the war. When then in 1945, he came back uh, and became a public prosecutor, at first in the city of Braunschweig, and later on, and this is where he became very famous, he was a general public prosecutor for the, for the federal state of Hesse in, in Frankfurt. So there you are. This is a group of persons who, being persecuted by the Nazis, had to immigrate. And so, you know, it would have been sort of a logical thing to do to ask those, and there were thousands, also highly educated and well-trained lawyers, to come back to Germany to help establish the new state. So that would have been one group of people. Not that many, but there were uh, at least a certain number of them around. By the way, Fritz Bauer became uh, extremely famous because he staged what you here see on the left-hand side, the so-called Auschwitz trial, which took place in Frankfurt uh, before the regional court there, starting in 1962, where for the first time, really, in German uh, history, uh, a set of, of um, SS members who worked at the concentration camp were prosecuted by a German, uh, by a German court. Uh, and he sort of staged, uh, staged this, uh, this, um, this trial, being the prosecutor at, uh, responsible at that time. So that would be one group of people. The other group of people would be the little Freislers. Um, Roland Freisler probably is, is, is known to you. You see a picture of him here uh, in front of the swastika. He was, of course, uh, mostly known for being the uh, pres president of the so-called Volksgerichtshof, the People's Court. This uh, notorious Nazi uh, special court um, to um, try, um, how do you say, um, <coughs> to try um, resistance, uh, resistance per persons against uh, the Nazis. Um, he handed down, down one death judgment after the other. He was an extremely um, unworthy judge, unworthy person. Um, and of course, he couldn't be prosecuted after the war because uh, he was killed in a um, in a bombing attack in uh, I think in April 19 or in, in in February 1945. So he wasn't there to be prosecuted by some others. Where and you see a picture here on the bottom right of the Nuremberg uh, of one of the Nuremberg follow-up trials. You know, of course, that there has been this Nuremberg trial, the main trial, the first ever international criminal trial that took place 45-46, where the most um, notorious and, and most influential and still alive um, Nazi criminals were prosecuted. And then thousands of su 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 successor trials took place, and 12 of them in Nuremberg, in the very courtroom where the first trial took place, 
these not being international trials, but solely um, under the authority of the uh, of the U.S. administration, the occupying administration. But nevertheless, these 12 follow-up trials became extremely influential in the process of developing international criminal law further. And at that time, obviously, they were extremely uh, interesting because what the Americans did was that they focused on the German elite and uh, put together sort of... Uh, trials that would represent one or the other group. So there was a trial against doctors, there was a trial against ministries, uh, ministries. there was a trial against uh, SS members, there was a trial against um, lawyers in particular, the jurist trial, that was the third trial that took place. There, was also, there were also trials against militaries obviously. And you see a picture from that where we had um, uh, we had a mere half dozen of, of, of accused who were high-ranking German lawyers at that time. Uh, most of them coming from the Reich's Ministry of Justice. And you see here standing the then Deputy Minister, Franz Schlegelberger, who was uh, sentenced to life imprisonment by this American uh, military tribunal. And others were also sentenced to high um, imprisonments, none of them were sentenced to death actually, that's also quite interesting, whereas SS members and generals and others were you know, also sentenced to death by these tribunals, none of the lawyers were sentenced uh, to death. Um, but those sort of, so to speak, was, was the other group of people that you could choose from. People who in one way or other had you know, been part of the regime, of the Nazi terror uh, regime inside the ministry or as judge or as prosecutor. So there you were, those are sort of the, the, the two groups that they could choose from. Now coming to my, uh, to my uh, uh, third point, I wanted to shall go swiftly through the general atmosphere in <coughs> Germany with regard to National Socialism at that time. So we are in 1949, okay, so we are in 1949 we lost the war in 45, and then there were four years of occupation where the United States, France, the United Kingdom, and of course the Soviet Union tried to reorganize and restructure civil life and administration uh, in, in Germany. And there it was in 49, um, a constitution was handed down, our German basic law, the Grundgesetz, and uh, in September 49, we had the first general election, the first German Bundestag, the parliament convened, and we elected the first uh, chancellor on the left-hand side, Konrad Adenauer. Being together here actually with Hans Klopke, who later on turned out to be his deputy, his state's secretary, as we call them. And he also has a very interesting Nazi past. Adenauer himself uh, was persecuted by the, uh, by the Nazis, so, um, but, but his, uh, his deputy um, was very much part of the administration of the, of, of the Nazis uh, during uh, these, uh, these 12 years. Now, in 49, what's, what's happened with the ongoing prosecutions and the dealing with, uh, with the many Nazis that were still, still around? Two things I want to mention here. Um, one of the first things that, and it, indeed that was the first ever law that the Federal Department, uh, the Federal Ministry of Justice helped preparing, um, drafting, that was the, an amnesty law, okay? The Gesetz über die Gewährung von Straffreiheit, the Amnesty Law, which was passed um, shortly after Christmas in 1949, so the first, you know, the first year of the beginning of the Federal Republic of Germany, and it was called the Christmas Amnesty. And it did not pertain to um, murder or killing um, by, by, by Nazi laws, but it did pertain to minor criminal offenses, in particular in, uh, in, 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 in um, economic uh, situations, um, but it didn't exclude um, the amnesty of, of, of Nazis. So for minor uh, crimes like denunciation, for example, you know, my neighbor is uh, hiding a Jew, something like that, um, that would, could have fallen under, the, under, this, under this amnesty law. <coughs> so this sort of represents this one sentiment that you would actually 
you know, rather grant amnesty instead of looking and looking at it and prosecuting um, uh, Germans uh, for their uh, for their uh, crimes uh, before 1945. And the other one here on the right hand side, you see a document of, uh, of something that was also decided on in autumn of 1949, the establishment of a special unit, which was also for the first years actually within um, the Ministry of Justice authority. And this is the Zentrale Rechtsschutzstelle, as it's called in German, the central agency to uh, protect. And what did they protect? They tried to protect German POWs abroad. So first of all, we would say that's a general service that you would maybe your government expect to provide, that you have P the POWs who are still abroad and, you know, you know my Mind you, in, in the Soviet Union, there were still thousands of Germans under not so nice circumstances. But also in France and, 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 and England and even the United States, you had POW camps. So to, to help them and to seek refuge and so forth, that's certainly a good thing to do. And you would expect the government to do that. But at the same time, it was sort of also within the realm of this uh, central agency to warn Germans whenever they heard about a prosecution going on somewhere abroad. Don't go to France, they're looking for you. Okay, so that's a very interesting uh, sort of, um, a very interesting uh, scheme that developed within this agency that they undertook, in, by the way, with a great support of the of the German section of the International uh, Red Cross Committee, very interesting the, this uh, this combination here, but they did uh, help um, many uh, German Nazis to evade um, uh, prosecution by, you know, receiving um, warnings from them. So. Putting this together, you can tell that in the German uh, society at that time, and definitely in the government structure, you had the atmosphere of, you know, forgetting what has happened, uh, trying to help those who are still being prosecuted, um, but, you know, let's shield ourselves from further prosecution and let's go on uh, with our life. And this can also be shown by the prosecution rates. So you don't have to look into the details here, just to give you a, a, a grave uh, overview over the prosecution numbers, um, prosecution of Nazi criminals, of course. This is an overall figure, so it's also the allied um, the, the allied trials that, that, uh, con that started with the Nuremberg trial in 1945. And this is a sketch timeline 45 to 1970. And you can see three things. First of all, here, this uh, red arrow shows that with the foundation of the Federal Republic of Germany, the numbers dropped dramatically. You know, this is at 49. If you want to have the absolute numbers, we are talking about, uh, about 100,000 investigations that were going on. And we are talking overall of not even 7,000 convictions. Okay? And more than 4,000 of these convictions took uh, place in this, uh, in this timeline from for, uh, 45 uh, to 49. In other words, the Federal Republic of Germany only managed to convict about 2,000 former Nazis in the time, you know, they started also from 45 to, uh, to the 19, 1970. It always came to a standstill after, uh, after the federal government was, was in place. And then you see this, it's going up a little, uh, starting from 1958. What happened there? What happened was that uh, a trial was staged, the so-called Ulmer Einsatzgruppenprozess. It was on um, a handful of SS members, part of the Einsatzgruppen. Those were those police squads that were operating in particular in Eastern Europe behind the front, uh, the front behind the front line and killing every Jew and gypsy and you know those uh, kind of person that's, that, that, that were around in gas, gas uh, lorries and what sort of uh, the perverse things they invented to kill as many as, as possible. Those are the Einsatzgruppen. And uh, some of the, there was a, there was an incident in Stuttgart, and one of the prosecutors decided to make a, make a case. So he went ahead, and all of a sudden, there he was. He was um, in, indicting uh, several former SS members, and there was obviously a major uproar in German society. And so the polit politicians had to do something about it. And what did they do? They established another 
office, the central office for the investigation of Nazi crimes. So that now was not a federal office because due to our constitution, prosecution is not a matter of the federal government, but rather the states. Um, so that was a combination, uh, you know, the, 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 the authorities of the states, they put together their authority and had a, uh, created an office um, where they would, uh, on, in, with, in, in a common enterprise, investigate Nazi crimes. So that was founded in 1958. So taking a st step back here, do you see the schizophrenia behind that? I was just telling you about this agency that was there to protect um, Germans from prosecution and now you have an agency that should actually investigate and you could imagine that they didn't really fit together and they had they, they were at odds all the time the one of requesting you know information from the other that the other wouldn't provide and so forth so anyway this is uh, as I said a very schizophrenic situation and it's not only in the government structure that was an entire German society at that time definitely the case so and then uh, in 1968-69, you see the figures dropping again and coming down to a complete standstill, actually. Even though we are still uh, taking on trials uh, as we are speaking, you might know that, um, you know, even now, um, Germans now obviously being in their, in their early 90s, uh, being prosecuted uh, for crimes uh, that they committed in concentration camps, particularly in Auschwitz and other places. So what happened in 1969? Well, in 1968, um, the uh, Federal Ministry of Justice presented uh, legislation, presented a draft of a big law that had, you know, to do with basically uh, regulations on, on, on street traffic and so forth. It was a huge law. And uh, a part of this was a little amendment of uh, our criminal code. It's very difficult to explain the details how that worked. But because of this little amendment in the criminal uh, code, uh, the statute of limitation would apply to most of the Nazi prosecutions that were underway. That we just started in 58 with the new agency. Most of them had to be terminated in 69 after this law came into force and after our Supreme Court or the Federal High Court of Justice decided that that was actually in the consequence uh, that the statute of limitations would apply to most of uh, these these Nazi prosecutions that were actually underway. So after that, it came to uh, almost an immediate standstill. The person who was responsible within the ministry was this person, Eduard Dria. Now he was extremely famous in that time after the war because he was one of the he he, he wrote and edited one of the main commentaries to the uh, German criminal code. You know, we have a codified system, so we have these codes, and then people write commentaries to this code and explaining article by article and section by section what this article and this law actually means. And he wrote one of the most influential ones. Influential meaning it was on every judge's desk, virtually on every judge, judge's desk. And he was the responsible deputy head of the department of the criminal law section at that time when this law, which led to the you know, uh, statute of limitation application, when this law was passed. Now, what you see here, by the way, is sort of the front page of a personal file that we would have looked at. So you find a picture, mostly, you find the name, you find his uh, birth, and on page five, interestingly enough, you find that. Mm section where they actually had to, you know, identify themselves with their affiliation with the Nazi party. You see here NSDAP, National Socialist Party, he became a member on the 1st May in 1937. And he was a member of some subsections, um, this being the Lawyers Association of the, of the Nazis. So, what I was, what I'm, what I'm saying is that they all had to, you know, to open their own record. They all had to identify themselves as being Nazis. So nobody can say now that the ministry didn't know whom they were employing. They all identified their Nazi membership. Most of them, most honestly, said um, what they what they did and where they have been, um, because obviously nothing happened to them. You know, they weren't afraid of confessing that they were a Nazi party member. Another thing that's also interesting is denazification. You know, you had to identify that you went through denazification process, with, which most uh, of them uh, indeed did, and it was uh, required. 
And he was uh, identified category four. This is called Mitläufer, you'd say co-runner. So, you know, he was not totally unaffected by the law. He was not against National Socialism, but he sort of was a co-runner. Um, so that would be the category with which you could still be uh, employed by the new federal government. You know, if you were category three or higher, um, you wouldn't be allowed, but with category four, you would still be allowed. Um, it doesn't surprise you probably when you hear the figures that 97% of all Germans were identified category four or lower, uh, and only very few um, are indeed were categorized in a higher in, in category and couldn't, uh, couldn't proceed. So this is, uh, this is the story, a uh, little story here of Eduard Trier. At the time of National Socialism, he was prosecutor at the special court. This is also not the ordinary criminal court, but a special court that was established by the Nazis to try, according to their laws and their ideology, in particular political crimes, in a smoother and faster way from their understanding. And he was a prosecutor. Not by coincidence, he applied to get there. Okay, that was in Innsbruck, which of course, uh, ever since 1938, was part of the Reich, uh, although it's now obviously in Austria and has been before. Um, so he was a very prominent figure there, and he, and we will come to speak about this a little uh, later, um, uh, what uh, the individual cases that he had to deal with at that time. So the statute of limitation thing in 1968 and 69 um, abolished almost all prosecution of Nazi, of Nazi criminals. So coming now to my next point, talking about the personnel that was actually then uh, employed uh, in the Federal Ministry of Justice. Of course, you don't have to you know, be able to read this now. It just should give you an impression of what we are talking about here. This is an organizational sketch. It made our work indeed much easier that these kind of sketches were around ever since 1950. So from the very year on, on, year one onwards, they um, produced these sketches, and they had identified people, um, the names of the people that were responsible for these units. Okay, you see, the, you had these five departments, one being the central administration, the first being the, the general administration, and then it's uh, private law, second is criminal law, law of economy, and then administrative law and, and constitutional law. So those were the sections at that time. You see there were not that many um, units and subunits. Um, altogether, we have looked at more than 200 uh, personal files in our research, and 170 of them were actually employees at the ministry in that time from 49 until 19, 1973. And it was, as I said, easy for us because we could identify the persons that we are actually interested in because we had these sketches. Now this is a sketch of 1957, so um, in the eighth year of its, uh, of its existence, a rather sort of um, elaborate and comprehensive uh, structure was already, already in place. And now when we look at, uh, at the overall figure from that time, um, you see the timeline down here. The blue one indicates the general development of the staff. We started out with 35. There were 35 lawyers. We only looked at sort of the, uh, those with a legal background that were working in, in, in um, positions where they had actually some authority, right? We had 35 lawyers. At the end, we had 93. So when we look at this time altogether, we come up with a figure of 53% former Nazi party members working at the ministry in that time. That might overall maybe not so shocking, but if you look at the year we've just looked at in 1957, we had, um, and you see this here, a figure of 78, almost 78% of former Nazi party members working um, for the German uh, Federal Ministry of Justice at that time. Um, there were 23%, uh, and this is the bottom line, were members of the SA, the Sturmabteilung, which is a special paramilitary organization um, established by the Nazis very early on. There were sort of their stormtroopers. Um, 
and we had a decent amount of membership here too, where we didn't found, find, or only with a very irrelevant uh, amount of figure, is SS membership. So we didn't have anyone in, in that, uh, in, in amongst them, who were working in a concentration camp as a member of the SS, which is good news, I, uh, I would guess. But um, you know, the figure as such of membership in the in the party is distressing enough. I'm happy to discuss maybe later on uh, uh, the, the, the relevance of a Nazi party membership, you know, because obviously you can read this in different ways and people had different motivations to come become member of the party. But now let's just take the figure uh, as it is and I'm going to talk uh, in the coming minutes on individual careers and you can maybe see more what that meant for one or, or the other. Um, if we, by the way, look at um, the sketch again here, and we look at the head of the departments, um, mm -hmm. we find an, an, interesting, an interesting moment. At that time, 1957, we had of these five um, persons that were heading the, the departments, none of them was a uh, former Nazi party member. Two of them, the one here uh, um, on the, on the, in the middle, Erzik, was his name, and, and Joel, they were half Jews, and uh, the first here also was not a member of the Nazi party member. Um, right, and, the, and, and, uh, and but they were then, they were at that time already very old. They were all, both, uh, all three of them were born uh, late in the 19th century, and so they retired early 1960s, and when they retired, they were all um, succeeded by former Nazi party members. So then in 1964, the head of the departments were um, three party members, and those two that I've circled around here were not. And this is Josef Schafreutle. He was the department head uh, for the criminal law department, and uh, then um, Walter Römer, who was heading the constitutional law uh, department. Those were the only ones in 64 that were not uh, party members. And I'm going to talk a little about this last fellow, Walter Römer. What did he do? Him not being a party member. I love this picture, right? <laughs> I'm not saying why, but you could maybe. I mean, it's, uh, he really looked that way. I've seen other pictures. Anyway, um, he, he was not a Nazi party member, but he was um, at that time from 33 to 45 working as a public prosecutor in Munich. And he was actually responsible for the execution of sentences, which is not the most favorable job you could imagine in the prosecutor's office, but in that time you were also responsible for the execution of their sentences. Mm. Um, so that was his, um, his, his duty. And now, interestingly enough, whenever we spoke and we did as much as we could to contemporary witnesses, Obviously, those kind of people were not alive anymore when we undertook our our um, our research. But there were those who worked for them. You know, were uh, old at, old now, but they still knew them and and they had experience with how the life was at that Rosenberg uh, in the 60s. Whenever we talked to them, all of them told to us that we never spoke about not national socialism. And none of we didn't know any stories. None of them was a member, as far as we know, but him. They always pointed to him, saying he was a member and he actually killed Hans and Sophie Scholl. Mm. I don't know whether you know of the resistance group, the White Rose, but there was a very famous resistance group who in the early 40s um, handed out leaflets against um, National Socialism and against the war in Munich. There were students at that time and there was a circle of, you know, I don't know, a few people together with some um, professors who organized some sort of resistance. They were, um, they were found, um, denunciated, they were uh, brought to a speedy trial before Roland Freisler, you remember the picture I, I showed you from the People's Court, uh, Volksgerichtshof, they were tried and uh, speedily and executed the same day in Munich. That was uh, Hans and Sophie Scholl, the main figures of this resistance group. And now everybody in the ministry claimed he killed he killed them. Well, interestingly enough, this story wasn't true. I can tell you because I've seen the execution protocol of Sophie Scholl. That's that one here. Um, and it, it states here that responsible for the execution was Reichsanwalt Weiersberg. And the true story is 
that um, it had to go so quickly that the Reich's uh, administration and the Volksgerichtshof didn't, didn't bother to get the Munich authorities involved. They did it themselves. Okay, so that story that everybody has been telling us wasn't even true. But Walter Römer had a hard time sort of justifying what he did and, and, and claiming that he did not, was not responsible for that. And indeed, if he would have only supervised the execution, I mean, he was not responsible for the death sentence, you know, but he would have supervised uh, the execution in the uh, prison of, of, of Stadelheim. So anyway, he was part of the administration, he was part of the judiciary at that time, being a prosecutor and, and, and uh, being responsible for the, for the execution. Most uh, interestingly, and this is also what sort of uh, was, was one of the criteria for the people to be elected to become uh, uh, employee at the, at, the, at the Federal Ministry of Justice, were former um, experience in the drafting of laws because this is what the ministry does in Germany, you know, help drafting laws. And how can you prove experience? Um, the best way you can prove that you've worked at the ministry before. And this is what you can prove or can be shown here that at that sometime uh, early in the 1950s, we had half of all the members of the new government that have already worked for the old government in the Reichsministry of Justice. But this is something that they wanted, that was, was looked, at, looked for, experience in that, in, that, uh, in that regard. Now, when we look at the, uh, in, in particular, to give a, another example, at this, this is the Department 2. This is criminal law. I'm a criminal lawyer myself, so you can understand why I was so interested in particular in this Department 2, uh, doing criminal law and criminal procedure. Now, th those are the members of this department, and on the left and on the right, I have identified their affiliation with the Nazi system. You can see all of them were Nazi party members. This is also from 1957, all of them. And all of them were, had some place in uh, the former administration or the judiciary. You have uh, at least two who were junior consultants in the Rice Ministry of Justice. This one here and uh, that one here. And of course, the head of the department. Mind you, I told you just a minute ago that this head of the department was not a member of the Nazi party, okay? But I'm going to tell you his story now. Um, that's uh, Josef Schafreutle. And you can see again here, you know, he wasn't a member. Of course, he was a member of the, of the Lawyers Association, but that was sort of a natural thing to do, and it's, that's not so important. But he wasn't a party member. Um, and this is obviously what, after the war, he always carried um, in front of him, like, you know, a, I don't know, some, something holy, saying, well, I wasn't a party member, so you can trust me, you know. And indeed, something else in his life happened. Uh, he was working for the Reichs Ministry of Justice, okay? Um, he was working for the ministry until 45. And after the war, he then was taken on by the East Berlin administration to help establish the administration until at some point in late 45, the Soviet Union decided to incarcerate all former members of the Nazi government. So he also was brought to a detention camp and actually he then spent three years in Sachsenhausen, a former Nazi concentration camp, uh, now on behalf of the Soviet Union and the, the, and, and, and the occupying power uh, in East Germany. So then he came back um, in, in 1947 to West Germany and he uh, became again a member of the prosecution in, in, in Freiburg and later on he came to the Federal Ministry of Justice. And there, th those were the two things that, he, that, that really went uh, in his favor. He could say, I wasn't a member of the Nazi party for a second. I was persecuted by the communists. So I'm really an anti-communist and that is what we need right now. Anti-communism in the German society, as it was here, I suspect, in the United States, was the superglue for society. You know, if you couldn't identify with anything but, you know, being anti-communism, but being anti-communist, that would, that would hold uh, the strings together. So he could uh, prove that in both ways he would be the person to rely on. Um, now, when you look at the personal file, it's interesting because in 1942, you discover that his career suddenly stopped. I mean, he's worked within the federal government, uh, sorry, within the Reichs Ministry of Justice, at some time also with the, with the, um, with the judicial department of the Wehrmacht, um, um, but he wasn't promoted. 
And he wasn't promoted, obviously, because he wasn't a member of the Nazi party. So he, what, he, what did he do? He applied. Okay? He applied for becoming a Nazi party member. And a letter was wrote, written back to him saying, well, we can't take you on because you're too Catholic. And you come from a, the political Catholicism was sort of something that the Nazis were afraid of. And you come from that background, you have that background, so we don't want, want you in our party. So he complained. And he sought the help of Roland Freisler, who at that time was, uh, was his, his boss in the ministry. Um, you know, think of Roland Freisler, a very prominent figure in, uh, in the Nazi regime. Um, and he complained. And he complained by saying, uh, you know, that he himself isn't Catholic, not at all. And, you know, even if his, his parents were Catholic, that's not, you know, his fault. And, uh, he's a uh, super national socialist and he wants to become a member of the party. This is the way he, he complained, you know, in eight, on eight pages he goes on and on and on how he should be a member of the Nazi party. They didn't take him. They didn't take him. And now, uh, in brackets, that does tell something about the importance of the Nazi party membership, doesn't it? Because they didn't take on everybody. You know, they looked at the persons, they looked at their careers and then they decided, and some of them, like him, they didn't take them on, even if they complained, and even if they were a member and a reliable member of the of the administration, um, he wasn't allowed into the party because he was not sort of one of them. He was considered to be a uh, Catholic, to be an outsider. So there he was. Nevertheless, of course, after the war, he told nobody that he wanted to become a party member, but he said that I wasn't. Um, and this, this is why he became such an extremely influential figure. Whenever you had a problem, in particular with your own past, you could always turn to him and he'll help you out. Okay? He'll write a nice letter saying that, oh no, you're a very reliable person, Nevertheless, never, never mind that you've spent time at the Volksgerichtshof or someplace else. You know, he would be the one to turn to. Okay. Now, for the next uh, couple of minutes, I can, if you want, um, tell you about some real scandals that took place uh, after the war in, 19, uh, uh, in, in, in the Ministry of Justice. And the first one is this person here, Max Merten. Now, Max Merten, as a matter of fact, he only uh, was employed at the Ministry of Justice for a very, very short time, for six months. Allegedly, they discovered what had happened before, and they asked him to go. That he wasn't sacked or anything. He left uh, voluntarily, but allegedly he was asked uh, uh, to go. Well, he was pr uh, before he was working for the Reichsministry of Justice. He was a member of the party since 1937, and then he was transferred to Greece, where he worked in Thessaloniki um, for the war administration, the German Wehrmacht administration at that time. And as such, in 1944, he organized the transport deportation of more than 50,000 Jews to the concentration camps, together with Dieter Wislicheni, um, who was later then prosecuted uh, in one of the follow-up trials, and Alois Brunner, you might have heard of. He was definitely the right hand of Adolf Eichmann. He was never found and was never prosecuted. Why is that? because he was helped by this organization that I was telling you about. He was warned against prosecution uh, that, was, uh, that was underway, and so he abducted and made it uh, somewhere to, the, to, the, to, to Lebanon and Syria. He you know, showed up there as being a military advisor to the, to the uh, Lebanese government, as far as I can remember. That some, somehow he was, his life remains a secret. But this is the person he worked together with in the deportation of, of the Jews. After the end of the war, he was uh, shortly brought to, uh, brought to Dachau and held uh, there as a POW. And then in 1952, he made it to the Ministry of Justice. He was employed there by about six months. As I said, then he was asked to leave. And then even if um, he was asked not to go to Greece because he was warned that they were looking for him, he went to Greece to sort out some private business. Not really clear what, uh, why, he, why, he, why he went, but he was arrested in 1957. So far, so good. But the interesting thing is, and you see, I mean, even if the ministry asked him to leave, that would actually be a good thing. You know, they discovered that they made a mistake, and then they asked this person to leave. He shouldn't be part of the administration. But what happened then doesn't show that they were of that good spirits in the ministry. Because they sent, uh, they, 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 they initiated what I would call a, a, a rescue operation for this uh, Max Merten. They sent this person, Ernst Kanter, as a, chief negotiator uh, to, to Greece 
Um, Ernst Kanter himself, as you can see here, he was a, a pre-1945 chief military judge in occupied Denmark. All the death sentences that were handed down by military courts uh, in, the occupied, uh, in the occupied Denmark were signed by him. You know, they all went uh, over, his, over his desk. Um, after the war, he became then uh, part of the judiciary and um, was at the Federal Ministry of Justice until 58, when he was promoted to become a federal judge at our High Court of Justice. So he was sent, so a very prominent figure of the ministry at that time, he was sent uh, to, to, uh, to undertake these negotiations with, in bilateral talks with Greece. They even went to the Greek king and uh, tried to get Max Merton out of Greece to avoid prosecution and trial there. And they promised everything they could, you know. They even promised that they would try Max Merton at home themselves. Of course, the Greek, the Greek, uh, Greek uh, government knew that that wouldn't happen because nobody was prosecuted, particularly not lawyers, were prosecuted by, by German courts. Um, so they actually didn't ex extradite him um, and he was sentenced to 25 years of imprisonment by a Greek court. But then in 59, he was uh, released, he was not released, but he was extradited for further execution of his sentence to Germany, where, as a matter of fact, he was immediately released. <laughs> and there was a further trial then underway, but in 68, um, this trial again was discontinued. And uh, mind you, he was even paid compensation for the suffering of pre-trial detention in Greece. So altogether, a rather sad story. Another continuing career that we uh, have to cope with is Franz Maasfeller. Uh, Franz Maasfeller is very much one of those responsible for drafting these laws, these pervert laws, which I've talked about at the beginning, um, about the privileged marriage. So he, was, uh, he helped drafting the race laws. And in particular, he wrote a commentary on the uh, uh, um, race laws, the Nuremberg race laws. You can see that here. Uh, on the right hand, uh, on the right hand side, in several editions, he explained, you know, article by article, what uh, what these race laws m meant. Um, he was also not a member of of uh, the National Socialist uh, Party, but he was leading the family law unit since 1934 in the Reich Ministry of Justice. He was also a member of uh, some sub-council for the Akademie für Deutsches Recht, one notorious Nazi think tank in Munich to elaborate and, 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 and uh, um, establish Nazi laws. In 1936, as I said, he wrote this commentary on the Nuremberg race law. In 1942, he was participating on one of the follow-up conferences to the Wannsee conference, which of course dealt with the final solution to the Jewish question. Um, in 1949, then, after the war in the denazification process, could you believe that? He was actually declared not to be, to be not affected by the law, uh, notwithstanding the fact that he did all that. And then in, from 1950 to 1964, he was again serving, this time for the federal government, and mind you, for exactly the same unit that he did before. He was also heading the family law unit in the Federal Ministry of Justice. And I have a third one for you. This is also um, uh, a person, Heinrich Ebersberg, who I like that picture too, because that was actually taken in Nuremberg. He was not uh, uh, prosecuted in Nuremberg, but he was um, acting as a witness on behalf of one of, one for, of the defendants at the jurist trial. In that time, this uh, picture was taken of him. Heinrich Ebersberg. Um, he was a member of the SA, and uh, since 1933 and then from 1937 onwards from for the Nazi party and um, he was the personal assistant to um, the deputy minister Franz Schlegelberger the one who was convicted to a life sentence in the Nuremberg jurist trial um, he was his, his personal assistant in 1941 he participated in a T4 conference you might or might not know T4 this T4 project was the euthanasia program part of the euthanasia program established by the Nazis and the Reich Ministry of Justice was involved in so far that they barred anyone participating in this program from being prosecuted by an ordinary court. Um, so he was part of, uh, part of this and uh, he was uh, as the assistant to the minister later on responsible for a program that was called correction of insufficient judgments. So that's a very odd thing but um, whenever the, f the, the government, uh, the Reich government um, learned of 
a proceeding and a judgment that they were not happy with because the sentence was too mild, they could intervene. Okay? They could intervene and decide without further trial, without further hearing, that this particular convicted person was to be brought, uh, was to, be brought to a concentration camp. Okay? And execution of the sentence would, would have uh, taken place in a concentration camp, which by the end of the day meant death through labor. I mean, that was the idea of not the death camps of Auschwitz and, and Sobibor and others, but the, the, the camps in Germany, most of them were sort of established to uh, exploit the workforce to such an amount that those people would actually uh, eventually die. So that was the sentence then. Uh, it was definitely meant to be a death sentence. So he was pr responsible for that program. In 1949, uh, he then became a judge at the Regional Court in Lower Saxony. In 1954, he was a member then again of the Federal Ministry of Justice, and he was the deputy head of uh, Department uh, 3 for economy law, and actually he was the only one where we could find some sort of um, some sort of reaction to the allegations which were then brought forward, um, that he'd been uh, such a person in the Nazi time. And he was not asked to leave or anything, but he was not promoted, and indeed he was in, in halfway through, if you wanted to put it that way, degraded uh, and not deputy head of the department, but he remained sort of the head of the ordinary unit for economy law. The prosecution uh, actually that were established against him, criminal prosecution that were underway, had to be terminated. Why? Because of the statute of limitation that applied, because his colleague from the other department initiated that law that would then eventually lead to this um, to this uh, result. So there you are, this, uh, those three uh, careers of people who have worked for the Nazi government and later on worked for the, uh, 